Okay, my talk is called Why Blockchains Are a Bad Idea. I know that most of you in this audience, I've been told throughout your whole life, blockchains are the solutions to all your problems. You got supply chain management data that you want to store, make it highly available, put it on the blockchain. You got medical records that you want to make available to patients, to doctors, put it on the blockchain, okay? There's more. Let's say you've got land deed documents. Who owns certain pieces of property? What do we do? We don't, oh, that's right, we do put it on the blockchain, right? Interstate medical licensing. How do we make these licenses available to different states when doctors move? Put it on the blockchain, okay? It's a blockchain Christmas for everyone, okay? Or Kwanzaa or Hanukkah because I respect all faiths, okay? But <laughs> let's slow down a little bit, okay? Let's ask ourselves the question, what properties do blockchains provide? And then what properties do applications actually need? I'm going to argue that there's a mismatch between these things. So at a very high level, what is a blockchain? It's three things. It's distributed storage. That's where we're going to store the data that's in the blockchain. It's smart contracts. That's what's actually going to represent the state of the application built atop the blockchain. Then there are some rules for block creation. So let's look at distributed storage real quick. So uh, in a blockchain, what happens is that each participant is going to broadcast the messages that it wants to put in the blockchain to the other peers. And then what the peers are going to do is build a local view of the global transaction state for the blockchain. So for example, we've got Alice, Bob, and the ever surly Mallory. So let's say that Alice wants to put something in the blockchain. She broadcasts that message to everybody. Both Bob and Mallory store that message. Similarly, Bob might want to put something on the blockchain. He broadcasts it. Everybody stores that message, and so on and so forth. And so what we see is that in this type of setup, no single peer can modify or destroy the global ledger. At worst, they can do that to their own copy. But hopefully, if other peers have copies of the blockchain, they can always present that original good copy to an outside party. All right, so part two, smart contracts. So what I described to you as messages before were actually tiny pieces of code. Think of them as little programs. So let's say that we've got Alice up here. These might be the messages that Alice has seen. Right? The first three messages are actually pieces of smart code that might initialize the initial cryptocurrency balance for each one of the participants. Then the last three messages, the last three transactions, might represent transfers of cryptocurrency between uh, participants. And so what you'll see is that a blockchain is actually a ledger representing the history of a distributed computation. Right? By executing the code from the top all the way to the bottom, we execute a computation. So part three, the block rules. These transactions, these tiny pieces of code I've been talking about, they're actually grouped into blocks. Okay? And each block is going to point to the previous block. So in our prior example, we might take those six transactions up there and group them into blocks like this. Of course, there's a natural question, who controls which transactions go into the block? Um, so there's a bunch of different rules for this. Let me briefly describe how a Bitcoin-style blockchain networks handle this issue. So any participant, let's say Alice, can do the following. Alice is listening for broadcasts from other participants. Once she accumulates a certain set of uh, transmissions, she can solve a math puzzle. Okay? She solves a math puzzle involving the transactions that she's collected, a new transaction that Alice is going to create, which is going to give her a reward, and also a reference to the prior block. Okay? So let me give you a concrete example of that. Here we might see a very simple block. The top two entries are transactions that have been broadcast that Alice has heard. That third thing is an increased balance uh, piece of code, which is essentially going to act as what's known as a mining reward. Okay? These mining rewards are the things that incentivize participants to actually collect blocks and make them available to others. Because if you don't collect those blocks and make all of them available to others, you cannot then prove that you should get that mining reward, because your mining reward will be detached from the history of the overall computation. And then we see the pointers to the prior block and the puzzle solution as well. So when a peer in the blockchain receives the block, it's going to validate that the puzzle solution is correct. And if so, that peer is going to add that block to the local copy of the blockchain. OK, so this all sounds good, right? So Alice decides to go to sleep, and she starts to dream. Ah, yes, but much like in everything in life, her dream becomes a nightmare. She starts worrying about what could go wrong with the blockchain. What if Alice and Bob solve the math puzzle at the same time? Okay, this is known as the fork problem. You can imagine if two parties try to issue a block at the same time, how do we know which one's the right one? It's tough. Think about Mallory, who we know is surly. What if Mallory gets lucky, and she solves a bunch of block puzzles in a row, but doesn't tell people immediately? Okay, she hoards those puzzle solutions and then issues a bunch of blocks all at once. Right? That can cause other people to waste work because they didn't know about these pre-existing uh, puzzle solutions. 
What happens if Mallory has a bunch more computing power than Alice so that Mallory can actually solve puzzles much faster than Alice? Well, this is called the majority mining problem, and this can cause issues of fairness, right? Because Mallory's gonna be able to get many more block rewards uh, than Alice can. Similarly, what if Mallory is just a jerk? Whenever she hears about transmissions from Alice, she just doesn't put those transmissions into her block. Okay, this is what I technically call the Mallory's a jerk problem. Okay, <laughs> all this stuff can happen too. So look at all these problems up here, and let's ask all these, you know, what's a question here? Like, why doesn't SQL Server have these problems? Right? Why haven't we been sitting in these meetings that we just heard about saying, oh my God, what if Mallory has more computer? Right? That's interesting. And so what I would ask you today is, what if I told you that blockchains are a poor fit for most applications? Right, so allow me to explain. Let's look at the question of what real applicant, thank you very much, young man. <laughs> Let's look at what real applications need, okay? And we're gonna motivate this by looking at some of these things that I mentioned to you before. I'm gonna make five claims. The first claim is that I really need to know who you are so that I can sue you, okay? In a lot of these use cases, participants have out-of-band relationships in real life. Okay, so what this means is that these real life relationships, for example, between entities that have tax IDs, right, that's gonna decrease the likelihood of malice because I can always sue you in the real legal system. And so what this means is that in many, if not all of these use cases, Bitcoin style anonymous identities are actually a bug, not a feature, okay? Because I can't sue a hex address, I can sue John Smith. Okay, second observation. I don't actually need mine rewards in a lot of these situations because my benefit that I accrue from participating well is not getting sued, right? Because you know who I am. So a lot of these mining abstractions are just completely goofy. Furthermore, cryptocurrency abstractions in general are oftentimes unnecessary. For example, if I'm a business, I want Visa or the government to be able to sue you out of existence or take your money. Let me give you a concrete example why this is tricky in the blockchain. So you may have heard about certain disputes, and let's say Ethereum, for example, about which forks should we be looking at, right? So how do these things get resolved? Well, in a lot of these blockchains, it's a bunch of dude bro disputes. People sit around, it's like a bunch of people who are unelected, who just push stuff to GitHub, and they say, well, I think that so on and so forth. Bring Visa in, I want them to just take my money back if I think that you, know, you haven't given me the service that I've tried to buy, right? And furthermore, think about this. Many applications don't need a notion of in-app currency, okay? My application is not really Angry Birds or something like this, right? So why should I have some side currency when I can just use the regular fiat currency that gives me access to things like you know, fraud protection from Visa? Here's my fourth observation. In many of these blockchain uh, applications, the number of readers may be large, but the number of writers is oftentimes quite small. So for example, interstate medical licensing, roughly speaking, the number of writers is gonna be 50, one for every state. Okay, if you think about supply chain management, then maybe there are hundreds or thousands of writers, perhaps. It's not millions. And so what this means is that arbitrary scalability is actually a non-goal. It's very interesting to think from the Star Trek perspective, like, ooh, what if every electron in the universe could somehow write to my blockchain, right? It's not gonna happen. <laughs> And fifth, let me just point out that almost all of these applications do not involve the manipulation of virtual on-ledger commodities, okay? So if you're a lawyer or an economist, I think this point is very interesting, right? Most businesses do not involve the manipulation of virtual commodities. Instead, they involve observations about the real world. For example, who has a medical license? So what this means is that most blockchains, most ledgers, only need to store observations, that is to say data. They don't need smart codes. They don't need smart contracts to enforce these notions of virtual commodity semantics. Aha, so you might say, who is going to enforce the semantics for things like medical licenses? Well, the answer is that these semantics are defined or should be defined using higher level code in the legal system, which has worked up to this point before anyone ever thought about the blockchain. It's so funny that we were able to build, for example, the pyramids without the blockchain to manage <laughs> supply chain. And now all of a sudden, everybody is claiming that without the blockchain, just nothing can be done. So everyone, let's just kind of calm down here. So, okay, at this point, you might be thinking to yourself uh, about IBM Hyperledger. Perhaps some of you have heard of this. This is what's known as an enterprise blockchain. And so it is designed specifically for the use case of businesses who may not have some of the other requirements that cryptocurrency applications need. So what's great about Hyperledger is that it does eliminate cryptocurrency abstractions. There is no mining, for example, built in to Hyperledger. That's great. 
But what's bad is that it does still embed notions of smart contracts into the ledger. As I've argued, in many cases, you need dumb data, not smart contracts. Furthermore, uh, Hyperledger uses this technology called BFT to determine who makes a block. Uh, we can geek out about the lower level details of BFT in the session if you like, but suffice it to say that BFT is unnecessarily paranoid about the types of misbehavior that nodes can do. Because if you think about it, if we know all of the real life identities for all of the participants in the blockchain, that's actually gonna put a limit on the type of uh, bad behavior they might do because they can get sued in the real life world. Okay, so I've burned down your blockchain house. It seems like I've led you to a very, very dark place. Don't worry, I have a solution that's me coming from a star field giving you esoteric knowledge, okay? <laughs> so I spent so much time making that slide and it was just for that reaction. Thank you very much. <laughs> you made a person very happy today. So, Here's what I'd like to talk about uh, in the breakout session, right? So myself and some people in my research group were thinking about what would blockchain technology look like for sort of more realistic applications. And we think there's a couple features. First of all, we think we can make block generation much faster by abandoning some of these very adversarial notions that Hyperledger or traditional Bitcoin style uh, blockchains assume. And once again, we can relax on those very adversarial assumptions because we know people's identities in real life and we have the legal system issue. Uh, we also think that writers can append dumb data and not smart contracts, as I mentioned uh, earlier, because most use cases don't require the management of uh, on uh, ledger virtual commodities. By only appending dumb data, we can make our ledger much faster. We also think we can use fast, well-known crypto to provide a minimal but sufficient set of ledger features. What are those features? Tamper resistance, okay? So we don't want someone to be able to change something on the blockchain after the fact. We need to be able to detect that. We can just use regular digital signatures for that. Non-repudiability, that's another important property. That means that if I add something to the blockchain, I should never be able to later say that wasn't me who did it. We can also use digital signatures for this. This has been known for you know, 40 years. Ordering, right? I want to make sure that you know, this message will always be considered to come after that message. We can use a technique called hash pointers, a well-known technique once again. And finally, I think we can actually leverage commodity cloud storage to handle a lot of our storage needs here, right? The people at Amazon, they have beepers for a reason, right? Because they're being paid to keep our data highly available. So all these problems you have in the blockchain, it's like, oh, what if the peer who's storing my data goes offline, right? Amazon, like they stay up late at night trying to prevent that kind of thing from happening. So let's leverage that. So let me close with a parable, okay? So you may remember this thing called Tamagotchis. Okay, so Tamagotchis were a very fun virtual pet, right? Your little buttons, right? So you get this virtual egg, you feed it, you play with it, and then like something happens. Like you don't, like that's gonna happen. You're like, did I kill it? Is that the way it's supposed to look? Like we don't talk about Mr. Pepper anymore. He lives in heaven now, right? So what if somebody came to you and what if they said, I got this great idea. It's called Tamagotchi chain, okay? So we've got Alice here at MGH, and so she's gonna take health records and distribute them across Tamagotchis, okay? <laughs> so we're gonna encode each medical record as a series of play plus feed commands. Now, of course, individual Tamagotchi owners may be malicious, so we somehow have to recover against this. So we're gonna replicate each record across multiple Tamagotchis. We're gonna use techniques like read Solomon error codes to sort of uh, protect against bit flip errors. And of course, we've got to incentivize individual Tamagotchi owners to participate in the system. So to do that, we're gonna randomly take Tamagotchi owners out for ice cream every week, okay? This is not smart, <laughs> right? And hopefully you see the well-laid trap that I put out there, right? We see that example and we feel that it's not smart because there is a mismatch between what Alice is trying to do, to store health records, and the sort of interface that's provided by the Tamagotchis. And so what I like to talk about in the breakout session is, you know, to what extent can we remove this mismatch between blockchain technologies and the higher level applications that sit atop them? So thank you very much.